Come on, Jeannie. Yeah. You haven't done it in the last two episodes. No, I haven't. Everybody, welcome to the Bible. Wait. What? Hey, you did it. Yeah, that sounded exactly That's, like you, I feel like. Well, I don't know. That makes me sound like a very high voice, but yes. Like, I could have done it like the Bible. Wait. What? Oh, I can't get up there. No. no. Jimmy <laughs> couldn't did. get that high. He, he, funny, as we were doing it with yeah. Jimmy, as each episode went on, his voice got warmed up and he got higher and higher. Oh, did he? Oh, <laughs> can't wait to listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about 2 Samuel chapter 18 here today and these are some very interesting chapters in the in the Bible. Tragic stories. Tragic stories, family complications, war, betrayal, game of thrones stuff. Yep. Succession. It's all in there. Yeah, it is all in there. Because this is life. This is human life. You can yep. think of this is the court of England under Henry VIII, same kind of intrigue going on. Family feuding, all that sort of stuff. Yep. Yes. And so what we have is King David has been forced out of his kingdom by his son, yep. Absalom, who wants to kill him. Yep. And Absalom has launched an army to go after some unwise advice, intended to be unwise, foolish advice. David, sorry, Absalom in his pride takes the advice and goes after David, leads this huge army, crosses the uh, Jordan River and is expecting to have a great win, that he would come back and uh, be the king. And in fact, at the end of this, we read that he's already set up. He's already had an altar erected to him. Uh, yes. A monument. A monument. Erected to himself. Yes. Yep. Yeah. I think That's it's this right. chapter. It is probably, yeah. if not the next one, definitely. Okay. So he's expecting this to go very, very well yes. for him. But it goes a little bit differently. Yep, not Quite what he, differently. Not what he expected. <laughs> not what he expected. So David has had time to organise his forces. If Absalom had taken the first advice, which was wise counsel, David would not have had time to organise forces. But here he has. He's appointed captains of thousands. There you go. And captains of hundreds. Yes, it doesn't. It's in the Hebrew. It's in my little note. That's why I've never seen it. In the NLT, it doesn't mention it. It's just in a comment saying in Hebrew, it says captains of hundreds and thousands. Okay, so he has a, he has a large army. Yeah, he has. Mm. But perhaps the army came to him after he crossed. Maybe he didn't cross with yeah, this many. Yeah, maybe he didn't cross with this many. Because, yep. I mean, how could he fled from his home? And it would make sense home? that there would be ranks of the army that have been loyal to David who would go, we're not siding with Absalom. We're, we're switching allegiances and we're going to yeah. stick with Dave. Yeah. Imagine the town gossip at this point. Mm. And this is political division. This is. And ironically, this, furious, is, the, this is the political division that Israel – endured for seven years until David became king. This is what, what the after Saul's death, this is what it was like. There's all these people, it says the elders, some were saying we want David to be king and others were saying, no, we don't want David to be king. And there was all this political division. And now David's actions ultimately through his sin have brought upon his own people this same level of political division again. And, and we see, we don't see it played out with swords and javelins but we see this played out in political courtrooms still today because it's still the same human issue. This uh, allegiance and infighting and carrying votes and support, it's no different because it's still a human heart issue. Yeah. Like we pick a side and we are convinced no matter what that our side is right until the point it becomes very obvious that our side is wrong mm. or and has even, done something bad. Some still don't even And even then, it. yeah. Yep. They still refuse to admit it. Yeah. yeah. So Israel in these chapters here is – the people who have stayed, uh, sorry, who have stayed behind and have appointed Absalom as yeah, the king. That's the way to view Israel in this situation, yeah. Right. So everybody else is with David and de David deploys his troops. He gives a third of his troops to a guy called Joab, mm -hmm. which is actually his, his nephew, nephew. Yep. a guy called Abishai, who which is, is also Joab's his brother. nephew, yep. and another guy, Joab's other brother, uh, no. Oh, no, sorry. That was the end of that sentence. Yep. And Ittai. Ittai? The man the from... The Gittite. Ittai the Gittite or the Gittite. Ittai the man from Gath. This guy... Where's the Git? He's a Philistine. He's a what? Mm. He's a Philistine. Gath is the capital city, one of the five capital cities of the Philistines where David spent a lot of his time when he was running from exile from Saul. So David had gathered some allegiance among the Philistines during this time as well. And some of them had switched sides and Itai was one of them. He's 
one of the, all three of these, Joab and Abishai and Ittai, are all mentioned in David's Mighty Men at the end of Second Samuel. So yes, he's a Gittite. He's he's a he's a Philistine who had switched and become loyal to David. So David has some Gentile followers. Yes, he does indeed. Who else has Gentile followers in the Bible? Jesus. He might have some. Yeah. <laughs> He might, <laughs> he might have, have some. Yeah, yeah, he might have some. Yep. Uriah, who he killed, was a Hittite, also a Gentile. And he was fighting for Uriah. He was fighting for David. is a man in previous chapters. Who, Jesus didn't kill Uriah. David killed. Just yes, the David. Way you said it. Did, did, yeah, Jesus <laughs> did kill Uriah. David, Uriah was Bathsheba, Bathsheba's husband. Or as I David, like to say, Beersheba. Beersheba and I get it wrong. <laughs> so, yeah, so Uriah was a Hittite. So the... While we have national identities, we need to realize that they now know from archaeological evidence there was a lot, a lot of moving around. It wasn't as um, clear cut. People would switch sides. People would ch- change, to defect to the other side if they thought there was reason to do so, or for political gain, or or protection because they wanted to, to be on the stronger side. That was just an all common part of life back then. I just have to stop and pause for a second because if, and you know how some people when they read this they read David as a type of Christ. Okay, so if David is a type of Christ, Israel has abandoned him Mm -hmm. and Gentiles are following him. Yeah, I think that's... So isn't that what we read? That's what we're reading here. Here, but we'll also read that later on. Yep. It happens to Jesus. It happens to Jesus. I think there's an element of truth in that. So the kingdom, the original people of God have rejected their Messiah type leader, David, appointed another leader over them, Absalom, just like they do with Jesus? Yeah. Yeah, just like the, they reject Jesus. Ah. Oh. Yeah, because that's human heart. Human heart. So there are parallels in the David story? Mm. At multiple levels to Jesus, to David being a type of Christ. And he has lots of really strong moments, and then he has moments where he doesn't live up to that ideal. And he's a bad father. He's a bad father. <laughs> Keep mentioning yes. that. Yes. Yeah, he is. He's a flawed. He wouldn't, if he was I would a good say dad. He's a flawed yeah. father. A flawed father. I don't know that he necessarily was evil in his intention as a father, but like all of us, he was deeply flawed. No, I suppose I say bad. Yeah. Bad Meaning could be morally flawed. bad or, yeah, exactly. He was ineffective. He was bad in that sense. So I'm not saying he's morally bad, but he was ethically, sorry, but he was flawed because of. The, all the complexities of human relationships and family family relationships. Well, he had multiple wives, concubines, multiple children of varying ages. Yep. Absalom's in his 20s. Yep. And his youngest are in their Probably, five, six, yeah, around exactly. then. Yep. Yeah. And this is complex. This is deeply complex. And he's got nephews. So if you, ever wonder, if you ever him, wonder like, why, um, you know, why the Bible doesn't necessarily uh, seem in the Old Testament to outlaw this kind of polygamy it's because kind of the narrative does the job for you oh yeah <laughs> shows yeah. you how messed up and screwed up polygamous relationships are when you realize the level of um, vying for attention and and uh, playing one sibling off against another and all that kind of stuff it's just what's going to happen yes yeah and i um just because we were just talking about we had father's day recently you can see here the father that leaves the family a father that starts another family, causes issues. Yep. And all right. the children, they start infighting. And totally. so this is, is relevant to us now. Totally we have same. families, broken families. my years families. of pastoral care, I've seen that happen time and time again. Yep. Sadly. And I... I've seen it work well too, don't get me wrong. Oh, yeah. I have seen it work well, but it takes intentionality and from you know, the decision father. from the father or exactly. the parent. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to um, be, you know, play one off against another I'm not going to favor one over another. It takes intentionality because it doesn't work that You're easily. You're right, it without does. A... It does. Oh, it's fascinating. Mm. There's so much to read in this. Okay, let's keep going because I can talk about it for ages. Okay, where were we? The king then announced, I'm going to march with you. So they're going to go out and meet. Meet Absalom's army. Absalom's and army. And his army because Absalom's going to be at the, the head of the army, which he is. Okay, so the king says, I'm going to go with you. Now, how different this is when we read the story of Uriah and Bathsheba, he's not out marching with he's his group, with, with his no, troops. With the army, yep. So he's learned his lesson on that front. Yes, it seems like he's he's totally learned his lesson. I'm not going to ha- stay behind. I He's feeling responsible for this mess. I'm going to get out there and do something about it. So he's humbled. Yep. 
So humbly he says, I'm going to go out and march with you. And these three dudes say, no, you mustn't. His nephews say, you mustn't. Ne- two nephews and the other guy, the Gittite, the Gentile. Yep. If you march with us, uh, it's a bad thing because if we were forced to retreat, the enemy won't give it a second thought. But if half of us die, they won't do so either. But you are worth 10,000 of us. It will be better for us if you stay in the city and help from there. So they recognize that Absalom doesn't necessarily want a civil war in that sense. He just wants to kill. He wants David dead. David. David dead, yeah. But obviously David's lo- followers are loyal because they are going to fight for him. Yes. Yeah, he's got incredible. And among them are these messed up characters, Joab and Abishai, but they're still loyal to David. Yeah, and we talked about Absalom being full of pride in the last chapter. And here we see David humbled. Yeah. On multiple counts. Contrast his yes. attitude with Absalom's and they are polar opposite of each other at this mo- at this point. Yeah. So David actually says, if you say so, uh, I, I'll do what you think is best. So he stands beside the city gate as the whole army marches out by hundreds and by thousands. Mm. That would have been a humbling thing, seeing all these people going out to fight for you. For you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And he is a skilled skilled army man. Yes, that's so, right. He's, this is a dude who killed Goliath. <laughs> yes. It's a pretty good army soldier. Yeah. And the king orders Joab and Abishai and Ittai to deal gently with Absalom for his sake. So he doesn't want Absalom killed, yep. his son. Okay. And the bear whole, that in mind. Bear that in mind, yeah. And the whole army hear about this. They yeah. hear it. So we have a contrast. We have Absalom wanting to kill David and David not wanting to kill Absalom. We have Saul wanting to kill David and David not wanting to kill Saul. So David is doing what he does here. The difference is his reasoning for wanting to do it looks is completely different. His reason for not wanting to kill Saul was he didn't want to touch the Lord's anointed. He wanted to trust God. In this situation, his, court, his command not to kill Absalom has nothing to do with that. It's totally to do with his own brokenness and his own sense of failing as a father and his own sense of how he's created this mess in his family. And these are the ongoing ripple effect consequences of his um, adultery and murder with Bathsheba and Uriah. That's what the difference is here. He cannot bring himself to kill Absalom because he feels responsible for Absalom being in the position he's in right now. Father's guilt. Father's guilt. That's a good way to put it. Yep. And, and if you're in doubt, folks, just watch, a, listen a bit more and you'll see that that's clearly what's going on here. Yeah. And notice as well, he doesn't inquire of the Lord here. No, again. still no inquiring <laughs> of no, the Lord. No, he doesn't pray and seek God. There's no counsel sought by priests. He just organizes the army and goes for it. Yep. All right. So the whole army goes out to meet Israel and they actually end up fighting in this forest of Ephraim, mm-hmm. which, I mean, that's a skillful decision. You don't want to meet people out on the field. They're going to hide in the forest and have them come to them. Yes, that's right. It seems yeah. to be what's going on. Yeah, yep. and it results in a terrific slaughter. That's what it says terrific here. Slaughter. Terrific slaughter. It says that's at least 20,000 men laid down their lives that day. It says in my version. Yeah, of Israel. No, Israel are the people following mm. Absalom, Absalom, not following David. That's what they're called here. And this word, uh, the message here says, there was fighting helter-skelter all over the place. And the forest claimed more lives that day than the sword. Yep. Is this, that statement there linked to the next part where Absalom, he's running from David's men. He's riding a horse, I think. Uh, riding a mule, it says. Riding a mule, yeah. yeah. Even more. Well, that's, that's strange. Well, that's because he's the king. He's the king. The mule is supposed to be, I think, something that a king would ride on. I think that's right. Right, okay. Some kind All of right. show of power. So the battle's over. Absalom's on the run and he's on the mule and his head ends up getting caught in an oak tree yep. and he's dangling there. Right? Yep. Yeah, I know. It's a crazy picture. He's like hanging in the tree. Somehow his head's there. I don't know. I don't get it. I can never quite picture it. Yeah. Riding along. Maybe he's trying to duck underneath it and the, hit a branch. He's hanging there. He's hanging stuck in the tree. And just tell me, you know the verse, cursed is the man who dies yeah, on a tree. tree yeah. Is that because of this or is that at another time in the Bible? Oh, it's, I think it's after this. I think it's in Isaiah or something. But it may be hearkening back to this. I mean, because he's definitely cursed. And yeah. we talked about him being a man of pride. Yep. And there are this translation doesn't say it, but another one will say it, that he's caught there and his hair is all tangled. Yeah, his hair's tangled in it because he's got this thick hair. Yeah, so 
Yes, he no, he loves his hair. He loves Doesn't his he hair. measure his he, hair? He cut every his hair year? every. He cut it once a year and he measured it because he Was had it such like a five full, pounds or yeah, something. Such a full head of hair. Yeah. So he and he's also described as this very handsome. Oh yeah, he's like, got, he's got all man. the outward charm and appearance. And there he is, probably not hanging by his hair, but the, his proudful, <laughs> his crown of glory is twisted up and is uh, keeping him from escaping. Yeah, isn't that interesting? So the thing that he was. Putting his pride in was actually the thing that ultimately led to his downfall. Yes. Very good, yeah. Jenny. Yeah, he can't get out. Very He's good. all tangled there. So he's tangled pr- in his own pride. <laughs> yes. Wow, that's a lesson. Boom. Yeah, and that's why I say this is really about pride. Yeah, a lot that's of it. Right. Because if you didn't get it before, you're going to get it, it now. That's good. That's the narrative there. Very yep. good. Good thought. So, I don't know if I've ever thought about that. Yeah. About the link to the hair being his pride, but you're, that's. Exactly what the authors are trying to get you to think about. Brilliant. He can't get away. He's tangled there. And then uh, a soldier sees him and goes back and tells Tells Joab. Joab. And Joab is like, why didn't you kill him? I would have given you 10 pieces of silver silver for this. Joab goes, no way. Sorry, the the soldier goes, no way. Everyone heard the king say, look after him. He said, if I had done it, you would have been the first one to ditch dob me. Exactly. That's what he says. Yeah. No way. And it's true. And Joab he would. Joab would have just manipulated. Yeah, he would have. He wouldn't. Wasn't going to do it. So yeah. Yeah. He, he even says, it. if I even had a thousand pieces of silver in my hand, I would not have done this no. because uh, I'm not an idiot. Yeah, I'm not an idiot. <laughs> I'm lord of the king. <laughs> David would kill me, and, and you, you would, would betray be me. Quite happy to yeah. betray me. Yep. Yeah. So Joab, mm-hmm. David's nephew, Absalom's cousin, pierces his heart three, three times. Three daggers or. Sp- or javelins or something, sort, something, something like that, yeah. pierces his heart, but that doesn't appear to kill him because then his men come along and this so gruesomely says uh, they hack him to death. Yeah, that's exactly right. I, it probably did kill him, but it was just more this level of vengeance, bloodthirstiness, which was very prevalent in David, in, in Joab. When David was king during those seven years, Joab, it says, would often be out on raiding parties, bringing back plunder. And the, right before he killed Abner in cold blood, he, he came back from a raiding party with a whole lot of plunder. Jo- Joab was just, he was just a bloodthirsty, um, power craving um, kind of soldier. So he didn't have to kill him. So he just did it because he wanted to? Yeah. He, he wasn't have, meant he, to. He wasn't. I think he was bloodthirsty. He would have reasoned that I've got to kill him because I know what's best for Dave. He cannot, he cannot survive because well, as long as he's alive, he's a threat to the throne. So he, he thought he knew best. But to the point where he was prepared to go up, go directly against David's orders. But that's also coupled with this sense of his own bloodthirsty kind of attitude, which is so contrasted with David. I mean, if Joab had his way, he would have killed Mephibosheth. If Joab and Zer- Zer- um, Abishai had their way, they would have killed this guy Shimei who was throwing stones. Yeah. So their attitude of a warped sense of justice mixed with bloodthirstiness is contrasted with David's sense of justice mixed with compassion and kindness. Yeah. Okay. There's so many things going on in this story. Mm. <laughs> and then Joab, he, uh, somebody comes over, right? What is his name there? The guy, the jo- the, the runner you're talking about? Yes. Uh, what, na- what name is he? Oh, hang on. There's this point here. So, but hang on. Joab does actually show, um, compassion to the other army here because instead of following them he actually blows the ram's horn yep. so he command and he commands his his group not to go after the israelites so he shows compassion for them and that's a wise decision maybe or maybe not i think he's just thinking hey Ab- absalom's dead i'll get my, we'll get our troops back now i think he thinks once the threat to the throne is in place there's no need to kill any more soldiers because they're they're just doing what they're told They'll revert back to David now that they, that their Absalom is killed. Yeah, that's what I reckon. And revert thinks. back to him. And revert back to him as the commander of the army. Yeah. Yep. So once again, it's his own pride, and his own uh, confidence in his own ability. And they actually pull down here um, Absalom, and they dump him in a huge pit in the forest and pile a mound of rocks over him. Mm. And here's the contrast of. The reality versus the pride yeah, because... He, he a different monument for himself. Yeah, he made a monument, a pillar in the Valley of the Kings out of stones, I, I assume. And he said, uh, because I've got no son to carry on my name, he uh, he inscribed it with his own name. To this day, it's called the Absalom Memorial. Yep. So he's made this memorial of stones, but then he ends up buried under... Buried under a memorial of stone. Two things to say here that we won't go into any depth. Absalom did have a son... 
and you can see it recorded earlier in Absalom's life. But so scholars think the fact that it says he had no son to carry his name probably most likely means the son probably was died in infancy or in childhood. That right, would be okay. the most likely thing because there was a son. The second thing is if you go into the, the, the Kidron Valley today, there is a big um, stone monument there that's called Absalom's Monument. That is not this. Okay. okay. You'll see if you can Google it. It's like a it's like a rock cut tomb thing. That's not this. It's called that, but it's not this because that was only dated to like the second century or something. But it just got it carries that name. So just two things to know there. Don't when you see Absalom's monument and you Google it, it's not this. All right. Okay. Okay. I will do. Two things are just yeah, worth mentioning things. before we move on. In this part of the story, to humanize it or to put it in personal context, I can understand it because so many of us, if not all of us, actually want to be acknowledged like all yeah. of us want to ha- to be liked and have or have people remember us yeah have something worthwhile people say about us yeah so that pride that absalom has is actually within us all Good call. so we need to place ourselves in that story mm. and see that absalom is not doing something totally crazy he's doing no. something most of us would actually do we are supposed to see all ourselves in all of these characters that's the best way to do it rather than sit in judgment Oh, Absalom, you idiot. You can just say, no, where am I Absaloming? <laughs> Absaloming. Where am I Absaloming? <laughs> yes. You know, a lot of us want our names in lights or we yep. want a million TikTok followers or a million, I don't know, nah, <laughs> I was going to say dollars to our yep. Well, it can be dollars. It can be influence. It or can our be, name on a plaque yep, or yep. something like that. Even in churches, you know, people, the goal was to get their name on the back of the, the pew in the church. But really it wasn't selfless. It was selfish. All of those sorts of things. We can all do that kind of thing. Let me correct that. Not everyone who has their name on the back of the plaque was selfish, but there can be that. Yeah. Uh, there can be that kind of thing of I want accolades, I want recognition. And often, oftentimes it's rooted in insecurity, which is actually pride. Insecurity is pride. Yeah. And it's rooted in that sense of I need someone to say something or recognize me. And as Christians, we need to know that our security comes from God. And even if no one recognizes, Jesus does. We do it for an audience of one. There's a lot of human nature in this entire yep, chapter. Sure is. So we shouldn't just read it like, oh, Absalom, you bad man or something. No. Put yourself in the story. Put yourself in the story. Yeah. Yep. See how true it is to us today. So the next part here is what we were kind of talking about before, but I skipped over a bit. These these people arrive. Amma has Zadok's son. He comes over and he says, let me run to the king and bring him the good news that God has delivered him from his enemies. But Joab says to this guy, you're not the one to deliver the news today because really it's not good news. Not, he knows. Yeah, he See, knows. The thing. Joab knows that Dave's not going to be happy about this, but he's gone and done it anyway. Yeah. So he doesn't want Ahimaz to do it. Joab orders a Cushite. An Ethiopian. An Ethiopian. Or Yes. So uh, yeah, A Gentile? E- e- Egypt. Yes. Cool. Gentile. Yeah. Gentile. Dark yeah. skinned Gentile from Africa. Okay. So you go. You go tell the king what you've seen. And the Cushite says, Yes. And he, well, I don't think he can say no. He didn't no. have a choice. He says, yes, sir. No. But uh, Amahaz, who's Zadok? Zadok was the priest. Ahimahaz oh, was of one of those two dudes priest. that ran across the, the river and brought yep. the news to David. So so this is not only does Joab recognize this is not going to be good news. He's actually, he's trying to protect Ahimahaz, but he's pretty pretty much putting the Ethiopian the, yeah, on the line. Yeah, he values one life over, over another. another. Yep. Yeah. Because he doesn't know what For David's going to do when he finds out. Yep. All right. So Amahaz, but he keeps... He wants to do it, so he keeps begging go, Job, go. let me do it, let me do it. I always think of him, picture him like Donkey here going, pick me, pick me, pick me. Oh, right. <laughs> Jumping up and down, pick me, pick yeah. me. On uh, Shrek, I'm talking yes, about. Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's a funny show. It is. Okay, so but then Joab is like, why do you want to do this? You'll get no thanks for it, I can tell you. Mm. So Joab warns him a couple of times, but he decides to go and do it anyway. So there are now two people running off with the news. Yep, in two different directions. Yeah, and David is sitting on the gate. Between the two gates, waiting there, and the sentry or the watchman was looking out, and he sees one person running towards him. So the Cushite had left first, but Amahaz, who takes the lower road or a shortcut or whatever, yep. gets there quicker. Yep. Okay. And David assumes that this is going to be good news. Good news. Someone's running, so yep. he's expecting to hear good news, and then suddenly they see the sentry sees another one. There's another runner all by himself and the king is like, wow, this is Two awesome. lots of yeah, good news. Yeah, <laughs> good news. And the sentry se- recognises that it is Amahaz and k- the king says, he's a good man. He's bringing good news for sure. So Amahaz calls out and he says to the king, peace. And then he bows deeply before the king. He shows him um, 
He's humbled before the king. Yep. He shows him all the perfect honour that he should show at this point, yes. right? His yep. face is to the ground and he says, blessed be your God. He has handed over the men who rebelled against my master, the king. And King Absalom or David is like, yeah, but what about the young man Absalom? Is, first question yeah, out of his mouth. Yeah, first question he asks about his son. And Amahaz wisely says. <laughs> maybe on the run he's been thinking through Joab's advice and going, maybe I shouldn't bring the news. Yeah, <laughs> yes. So he tells the truth without being really yeah. clear, without being very he clear. He says there was a whole lot of confusion about yes. the time that Joab was sending me, but I'm not really sure, but this guy here, I think he knows about it. Have a look at him. Wait till he yes. arrives. <laughs> yes. So he dodges the question, yes. says it's kind of good, and the other guy comes in and he, the king asks again, first question, is Absalom all right? And he, what does he say? He says, may all of your enemies, my lord, the king, both now and in the future, share the fate of that young man, which sounds like a really encouraging yeah. thing to say, except when it's the king's son and he doesn't want the king's son dead, that's um, not a good thing to say no. to the king. Does anything happen to this guy? doesn't say. No. Where so, do we get don't shoot the messenger from? They didn't have guns back then, Jeannie, so it's well, probably... Don't kill the messenger. <laughs> yeah. I don't, Good point. I don't know. But it would be something like this. It would be from messengers in wartime coming... Yeah, because a lot of people think it comes from this story. Well, maybe it does. Parlay was a very normal process in military campaigns. You often see it in the movies where, you know, um, they're surrounding a city and they'll send a soldier or a, rep, a messenger up to the um, up to the gates to talk, to do parlay. That yep. was a means of trying to avoid w warfare. And I guess that would be a standard practice. So, yeah, it could come from this kind of thing. But it doesn't kill him. Doesn't kill him, no. No, he doesn't. He's just no. overcome with grief. Yeah. yeah. The king was stunned and heartbroken. He went up to the room over the gate and he weeps and he's weeping out loud and he's crying, oh, my son Absalom, my dear, dear son Absalom, I wish that it had been me instead of you. And that's why I argue that this is deeply rooted in David being aware that he has caused this mess. Even though he's not, doesn't let Absalom off the hook, he's aware of his poor fathering, his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah being the cause of this whole whole chamozzle that he finds himself in right now. And he is weeping. He comes to a point of brokenness in himself. Maybe it's all been pent up to this point and it's just, that's it. It's done. I know that you really have no answer for this. Well, you might. But I wonder when Christ went to the grave, did God weep? Can God weep? I don't know. In the same sense that David weeps here because he's killed by his own people. I have heard scholars argue about that point, that very point, that this was that was that separation whole thing. But it gets back to atonement theory as to what really took place on the cross. But I think there has to be a sense in which, while this is all God's plan, the Father is weeping that it came to this, that he had to, you know, to surrender his son over to this death so that he could reach those that didn't deserve to be reached. I, I think there has to be. Otherwise, we're not in touch with the emotion, the depth of emotion in our God. I would like to do a study on every time weeping is mentioned mm -hmm. in the Bible. We know that Jesus wept over Jesus death wept. and sin. Yep. Jesus wept over Jerusalem and he wept over death and sin. I think it's two times specifically that Lazarus and, and Jerusalem. And mm -hmm. there was a prophet who wept a lot. Jeremiah, yep. Yep. Yeah. yeah there's, there's plenty of weeping. Plenty of weeping in this yeah, story, and taking away tears in Revelation. Yes, yeah, it's, it's yeah, we're interesting. The theme of weeping, mm. yeah, sorrow instead of weeping. So you know, the oil of jad, joy instead of sort of mourning, all that sort of stuff. It's all there, yeah. And David is brought to this point. He's overcome by grief and sadness mm. and guilt. Yep. So different to the proudful, prideful. How do you say that? Prideful. Yeah, prideful. Yeah, yep. prideful man Absalom yeah, on his way out. At, uh, at this leading his army mm. starts off with a, a leading king, and now you have one weeping on a his weeping. knees. Yep, that's right. Yep, totally different personalities. Yep, though the ripple effect of our mm. sin and how it can play out. Yeah, family yep. life is complicated. So folks, yeah. nip it in the bud early. What nip? <laughs> that's sin. right. Nip sin in the bud. Yes, because you think, oh, this won't matter. It has drastic effects. The ripple effect, it's just one pebble in the ocean, and one pebble in a pool and it just goes out and it can affect all around us. Did David weep when he when Nathan told him what was going to happen th at that point? Uh, it doesn't say he wept, but I think he's vividly aware of it. But now he's weeping. He's now for he's sure weeping. weeping. Yeah, 
Yeah, now he's realizing, oh, this is what this, what that prophetic word was all about. Yep, the consequences yeah. of it. Let's keep going. All right, Move on. chapter 19 tomorrow. We'll talk to you then. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Bible. Wait, what? Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast so you don't miss a single episode. And you can also find us on all the socials. Just search The Bible. Wait, what? And to find out more about our church, just search C3 Camden, C3 Picton, or C3 Thoreau on the web or on the socials. Thanks for being with us today, and we look forward to talking to you on the next episode of The Bible. Wait, what?